Bob Dylan has been a subject of fascination not only for his groundbreaking musical contributions, but also for his intriguing romantic history. Throughout his illustrious career, Dylan has been romantically linked to a diverse array of women, adding an air of mystery to his personal life. Despite the plethora of rumors and speculations, the current status of his romantic entanglements remains shrouded in uncertainty. As Dylan is notorious for guarding his private affairs from the prying eyes of the public. Therefore, only in this video can you find out who is the true love of his life. Let's get started. Dylan's journey through the realm of love and relationships commenced with his first marriage to Sarah Lowndes in 1965, a union that spanned over a decade, concluding in 1977. The couple's relationship was marked by its highs and lows, providing fodder for the ever-curious public and media. Following the dissolution of his first marriage, Dylan ventured into matrimony once again, tying the knot with Carolyn Dennis in 1986. However, this second marriage was relatively short-lived, lasting until 1992. The enigmatic artist's romantic history extends beyond the confines of marriage, with associations with notable figures such as Joan Baez and Suze Rotolo. These connections have added layers of intrigue to Dylan's persona, as his romantic involvements have become intertwined with the tapestry of his musical legacy. Whether these relationships were sources of inspiration for his timeless lyrics or merely reflections of the tumultuous times in which he lived, Dylan has managed to keep the details largely veiled. Echo Hellstrom holds a unique and intriguing place in the personal history of the legendary Bob Dylan. Originating from Dylan's high school years, their relationship offers a glimpse into the formative period of the musician's life. During this time, Dylan and Hellstrom shared an intimate connection, shaped not only by the typical dynamics of young love, but also by a shared passion for music that would influence Dylan's artistic trajectory in profound ways. Their relationship unfolded against the backdrop of the vibrant sounds of rhythm and blues emanating from distant high-watt radio stations. Together, they immersed themselves in the soulful beats and melodies that characterized this genre, laying the groundwork for Dylan's later exploration of various musical styles. This shared musical journey became a cornerstone of their connection, fostering a deep bond rooted in the love for the transformative power of sound. Echo Hellstrom's familial environment played a pivotal role in shaping Dylan's musical sensibilities. Hellstrom's family, in particular, exposed him to a rich tapestry of sounds, introducing him to artists such as Jimmy Rogers through the medium of 78 RPM records. Additionally, Hellstrom's family provided Dylan with access to an extensive collection of folk music magazines, sheet music, and manuscripts. This exposure undoubtedly contributed to the eclectic mix of influences that would later define Dylan's distinctive musical style. One of the enduring mysteries and debates surrounding Dylan's early romantic entanglements is the speculation that Echo Hellstrom might be the inspiration behind his poignant song, Girl from the North Country. However, this claim remains a subject of dispute, and the elusive nature of Dylan's songwriting process makes it challenging to definitively prove or disprove such a search owns. The ambiguity surrounding the inspiration for this particular composition only adds to the mystique of Dylan's creative process. Bob Dylan's romantic journey took a significant turn with his first serious relationship, a poignant chapter in his life that unfolded with the artist Suze Rotolo. Rotolo, an artist herself, hailed from a background deeply rooted in the ideals of the Communist Party USA, providing a unique backdrop to their connection. According to Dylan, their meeting was nothing short of transformative, with him recalling, She was the most erotic thing I'd ever seen. The air was suddenly filled with banana leaves. We started talking, and my head started to spin. This vivid description reflects the intensity and impact of their initial encounter. The public's first visual glimpse into Dylan and Rotolo's relationship 
came with the iconic cover of Dylan's album, The Free Wheelin' Bob Dylan. The photograph, featuring the couple arm in arm on a New York City street, became an emblematic representation of the burgeoning folk movement and Dylan's role within it. Critics and fans alike noted the intimacy captured in the image, interpreting it as a visual testament to the emotional connection shared by the two artists. The influence of Suze Rotolo on Dylan's creative output is a topic that has intrigued scholars and enthusiasts for decades. Dylan himself has acknowledged the impact of their relationship on his songwriting, particularly in the context of some of his early love songs. Songs like Don't Think Twice It's All Right have been closely linked to the emotions and experiences of their time together, serving as musical reflections of the joys and challenges inherent in their romance. Despite the intensity of their connection, Dylan and Rotolo's relationship came to an end in 1964. The reasons behind the breakup remain private, adding an element of mystery to this chapter in Dylan's personal life. The conclusion of their romantic involvement did not, however, erase the imprint Rotolo left on Dylan's artistic soul. In 2008, Suze Rotolo offered her perspective on their time together by publishing a memoir titled A Free Wheelin' Time. The book delves into her life in Greenwich Village during the 1960s and provides insights into her relationship with Dylan. Through her words, readers gain a deeper understanding of the cultural and emotional landscape that shaped Dylan's early years as a burgeoning folk icon. The intersection of two towering figures in the folk music scene, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, gave rise to a complex and dynamic relationship that left an indelible mark on the landscape of 1960s music. When they first crossed paths in April 1961, Joan Baez was already an acclaimed artist, celebrated as the Queen of Folk for her influential debut album. Their initial meeting, however, was not marked by immediate mutual admiration. Joan Baez, already an international phenomenon after her debut at the Newport Folk Festival in 1959, recognized Dylan's potential and the power of his songwriting. With her distinctive soprano voice and a repertoire that passionately addressed social justice, civil rights, and nonviolence, Baez had become a leading figure in the folk movement. Her performances were not only musically captivating, but also resonated with a deep sense of moral and political purpose. Baez's pivotal role in Dylan's early career was marked by her generous invitations to share the stage and tour together, providing Dylan with invaluable exposure to wider audiences. Their collaborations on folk songs became a defining element of their artistic connection as they harmonized on themes of love, protest, and the changing social landscape. The Newport Folk Festival, a historic event in folk music, played a crucial role in propelling both Baez and Dylan into the spotlight. Baez's debut there in 1959 established her as a captivating and influential performer. When Dylan joined her on stage at the festival in 1963, it marked a momentous collaboration that further solidified their status as key figures in the folk music revival. Blessed with a remarkable ability to fuse musical talent with a commitment to social causes, Baez garnered attention from the press, who often portrayed her as the Virgin Mary of political activism. Her angelic voice and dedication to issues of social justice made her not only a musical icon, but also a symbol of moral and political conviction. As Bob Dylan and Joan Baez continued to perform together, they became a focal point of public fascination, heralded as the king and queen of folk music. Their relationship, both artistic and personal, was one of the most talked-about aspects of the 1960s. The chemistry between Dylan's raw, poetic songwriting and Baez's angelic voice created a compelling dynamic that captured the spirit of a generation undergoing profound social and cultural changes. In Mary Wharton's documentary, A Voice to Sing With, Joan Baez candidly reflected on the intensity of their romance, stating, I was crazy about him. We were an item. 
and we were having a wonderful time. How a ver despited the initial euphoria, the love affair eventually won ed. Bob Dylan, characterized by his adventurous and experimental musical spirit, emerged as a troubadour of his time. His repertoire encompassed ballads and poetic rock hymns that showcased not only his lyrical prowess, but also his commitment to addressing pressing societal issues. The civil rights movement, the perils of greed, and the horrors of war all found expression in Dylan's protest songs, making him a poignant voice for social conscience. Dylan's songwriting, characterized by a blend of poetic depth and social critique, produced quintessential numbers that transcended genres and defined a generation. From The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll, to All Along the Watchtower, to Mr. Tambourine Man. Dylan's ability to draw inspiration from the headlines and give voice to the struggles of the marginalized made him a transformative figure in the realm of music and activism. Joan Baez, recognizing the potential impact of Dylan's influence, encouraged him to stay focused on political activism. In those turbulent years, Dylan's role extended beyond that of a musician. He became a symbol for the youth of America, a figure from whom they sought answers. Baez, committed to social causes herself, understood the power of music as a tool for change, and she urged Dylan to embrace the responsibility that came with his influential position. However, Dylan, ever the nonconformist, resisted being confined to the role of a political figure. His discomfort with the constriction and fear associated with such a role became evident. The pressure to bear the weight of societal expectations clashed with Dylan's desire for creative freedom and exploration. Despite his commitment to social causes in his songwriting, he sought to resist being pigeonholed or remembered solely for his political statements. The dynamic between Baez and Dylan encapsulated the tension inherent in the intersection of art and activism. While Baez sought to harness Dylan's influence for social change, Dylan grappled with the expectations placed upon him. This complexity added depth to their relationship and shed light on the challenges faced by artists who become inadvertent symbols in times of societal upheaval. In the mid-1960s, Bob Dylan found himself at a crossroads in his musical journey, contemplating the themes and inspiration that would shape his next opus. Known for his keen awareness of the evolving music landscape and current events, Dylan immersed himself in a diverse range of musical genres, maintaining a finger on the pulse of the cultural zeitgeist. In 1965, as he embarked on the creative process for his forthcoming work, Dylan made a pivotal decision to incorporate an electric guitar into his set at the Reverend Newport Folk Festival, the festival, a bastion of avowed purists who cherished traditional ballads and simple accompaniments, eagerly anticipated Dylan's performance. The attendees had their hearts set on hearing their favorite artist in his acoustic element. Dylan, however, had other plans. During his opening set, he mesmerized the audience with the enchanting magic of his acoustic music for 45 minutes. The atmosphere was electric with anticipation. Then, in a moment that would become legendary, Dylan emerged with his electric guitar for the second half of the show and launched into Maggie's Farm. The reaction from the crowd was visceral. They booed. The disapproval was not merely a form of music criticism. It carried a sense of betrayal. The folk purists felt that Dylan had strayed from the essence of the movement, abandoning the acoustic simplicity that defined the Newport Folk Festival. Among those who felt the impact of this perceived betrayal was folk icon Pete Seeger, incensed by Dylan's departure from tradition. Joan Baez, a close collaborator and part of Dylan's entourage, shared in the dismay at the turn of events. The electric set at Newport marked a seismic shift in Dylan's artistic direction, signaling his embrace of a more electrified sound that would become a hallmark of his work in the years to come. Following the controversial Newport performance, Dylan took his tour to Europe, where he continued to explore the electrified soundscape. Joan Baez, however, used this opportunity not only to support Dylan, 
but also to lend her voice to political causes. With the Vietnam War escalating, Baez became an outspoken advocate for peace, love, and nonviolent protests. Even as Dylan faced resistance and criticism for his musical evolution, Baez saw the potential for him to align with her activism. Baez's intentions were clear. She wanted Dylan to resume his place alongside her in the realm of political activism, and she intended to push him in that direction. The tension between Dylan's evolving musical identity and the expectations of his folk purist audience, compounded by the political climate of the time, created a complex interplay that would influence both artists' trajectories in the years to come. In Joan Baez's memoir, And a Voice to Sing With, she provides a poignant and candid account of her experiences during a tumultuous period in her relationship with Bob Dylan. The memoir unveils the dynamics that unfolded during a tour where promises of equal billing and nightly duets with Dylan turned into a series of disappointments and hurtful slights. Promoter Bill Graham had initially assured Baez of equal billing and the opportunity for a nightly duet with Dylan. However, the reality starkly contrasted with these assurances. Baez's name appeared in tiny print on the posters for the events, a visual representation of the disparity between the promised collaboration and the actual treatment she received. The lack of respect manifested in various ways, whether from promoters, venue owners, or even Dylan's security guard, who reportedly hindered Baez from speaking to her friends during the tour. Contrary to the promised duets, Dylan did not extend invitations for Baez to join him on stage, leaving her feeling sidely need and isolated. This treatment was puzzling, especially given Baez's significant contributions to Dylan's early success. They had been collaborators, recording partners, and romantically involved. Baez, as Dylan's champion and lover, played an instrumental role in shaping his career and influencing his artistic direction. The memoir hints at a possible unraveling of their personal and professional relationship during the tour. It raises questions about whether someone crossed boundaries, if Dylan had a change of heart, or if external pressures influenced their dynamic. D.A. Pennebaker, who was filming the iconic Don't Look Back documentary featuring Dylan, had initially included Baez as part of the package. However, something shifted, and Baez found herself excluded from the narrative, highlighting the complexities at play. Dylan's response to Baez's attempts to assert some control over their evolving relationship was particularly hurtful. According to a Rolling Stone article, Dylan looked at her with disdain and treated her like baggage. The dismissal and distancing left Baez grappling with the emotional toll of being sit-aligned and disrespected by someone with whom she had shared both personal and professional connections. The fallout from the infamous 1965 British road trip between Joan Baez and Bob Dylan, immortalized in D.A. Pennebaker's documentary, marked a pivotal moment in their relationship. Following an awkward backstage encounter, Joan faced with the strains and complexities of their evolving connection, made the difficult decision to leave. Dylan's return to the U.S. in a funk was accompanied by swirling rumors of his involvement with drugs. The speculation intensified when he was involved in a motorcycle accident near his home, an incident that led to him dropping off the radar for the next eight years. During this period of relative seclusion, Dylan got married, had four children, and, unfortunately for Joan, seemed to have moved on, consigning their relationship to the past. Forty-four years later, in a moment of reflection and nostalgia, Dylan, while speaking to an interviewer, waxed poetic about Joan's voice, singing, and songwriting. In a surprising and heartfelt admission, he offered an apology for the breakup, acknowledging that his treatment of Joan occurred during a tumultuous period in his life. The apology extended to his desire not to taint her with the complexities of his messy career. Dylan expressed regret, stating, I feel very bad about it. I was sorry to see our relationship end. For Joan, 
Receiving this apology after decades brought a mix of emotions. Her eyes grew teary upon hearing Dylan's remorse. In response, she admitted that she may have contributed to the separation by pushing him away, attempting too hard to involve him in the many social causes she passionately pursued. The age-old narrative unfolded, a love story, where one partner, in this case, Joan, was more deeply invested in the relationship than the other. Dylan was both her heartache and her joy. Joan's challenge was grappling with a man lost in the haze of drugs, who seemed to freeze her out of his life. Despite the painful and messy breakup, Joan Baez continued to play a significant role in Dylan's creative landscape. He drew inspiration from their relationship, penning several poignant songs about her, including Just Like a Woman, Love is Just a Four-Letter Word, and Visions of Johanna, among others. The narrative of Joan Baez and Bob Dylan took an unexpected turn a decade later when, in a symbolic gesture of reconciliation and artistic collaboration, Dylan extended an invitation to Baez to join the Rolling Thunder Review. This tour, which unfolded between 1975 and 1976, was a dynamic musical odyssey organized by Dylan and brought together a diverse ensemble of musicians and collaborators, all masterminded by the visionary filmmaker Martin Scorsese, as documented in the Netflix film of the same name. The Rolling Thunder Review was a platform for creative expression and camaraderie, allowing Dylan and Baez to share the stage once again. The tour became a manifestation of artistic synergy, a testament to the enduring power of music to bridge the gaps between individuals and histories. It was a moment of musical reconciliation, providing a chance for both artists to revisit their shared past and create new memories on the stage. In 2019, after a storied career spanning decades, Joan Baez retired from performing but redirected her creative energies toward another form of artistic expression, painting and drawing. Her art became a canvas for social conscience with notable works such as The Mischief Makers. This collection depicted activists, civil rights leaders, artists, and others who had courageously fought against oppression and injustice. Within this diverse group of mischief makers, Bob Dylan found a place, alongside Baez's former husband, David Harris, who became part of the collection due to his imprisonment for draft evasion during a period of political turmoil. While working on Dylan's portrait, Baez selected a photo from his 1965 album, Bringing It All Back Home. The resulting piece was named Baby Blue, paying homage to It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, one of the songs from the album. As Baez immersed herself in capturing Dylan's image on canvas, their shared music played in the background. In this artistic endeavor, the layers of hurt and resentment melted away, replaced by a profound sense of gratitude for the moments they had shared, regardless of how their personal relationship had concluded. Bob Dylan's foray into family life took a significant turn with his marriage to Sarah Lowndes, a woman who brought her own blend of elegance and professional experience to their union. Sarah, having worked as both a model and a secretary at Drew Associates, became Dylan's wife on November 22, 1965. This marked a new chapter in Dylan's life, adding the roles of husband and father to his already multifaceted identity. The couple's familial journey commenced with the birth of their first child, Jesse Byron Dillon, on January 6, 1966. The subsequent years saw the expansion of their family as they welcomed three more children into the world. Anna Leah, born July 11, 1967, Samuel Isaac Abram, born July 30, 1968, and Jacob Luke, born December 9, 1969. Additionally, as a testament to the merging of families, Dylan adopted Sarah's daughter from a previous marriage, Maria Loans, later Dylan, who was born on October 21, 1961. Sarah Dylan played a distinctive role in the Dylan household, contributing not only as a mother but also taking on the character of Clara in Dylan's cinematic venture, Ronaldo and Clara, 1978. This film, directed by Dylan himself, 
unfolded during the Rolling Thunder review and provided a surrealistic lens through which the audience could glimpse into the world of Dylan's music and personal relationships. However, the complexities of their relationship eventually led to a divorce, marking the end of Bob and Sarah Dylan's marriage on June 29, 1977. Despite the dissolution of their romantic partnership, the impact of their union continued to reverberate through the lives of their children. One of the more notable outcomes of this marriage was the emergence of Jacob Dylan as a well-known figure in the music industry. Jacob gained recognition as the lead singer of the band The Wallflowers in the 1990s, achieving success with hits like One Headlight and Sixth Avenue Heartache. His musical journey showcased the continuation of the Dylan legacy in a new generation. Jesse Dylan, another of Bob and Sarah's children, took a different path, carving out a career in film. Jesse became known as a film director and business executive, making significant contributions to the world of entertainment and media. Bob Dylan continues to take an intriguing turn with his relationship with backup singer Carolyn Dennis, professionally known as Carol Dennis. The union resulted in the birth of their daughter, Desiree Gabrielle Dennis Dillon, born on January 31, 1986. This chapter of Dillon's life, however, remained veiled in secrecy, as the couple managed to keep their marriage and the existence of their child hidden from the public eye. Dylan and Carolyn Dennis exchanged vows on June 4, 1986, marking the official beginning of their marital journey. Despite the public's fascination with Dylan's personal life, the couple succeeded in maintaining a clandestine existence, shielding their relationship from the prying eyes of fans and the media. Their marriage, which lasted from 1986 to October 1992, was characterized by a remarkable level of privacy. Dylan, known for his enigmatic persona, extended this characteristic to his personal affairs, choosing to keep the details of his family life well guarded. It wasn't until the publication of Howard Sounds's biography, Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan, in 2001, that the world learned about Dylan's marriage to Carolyn Dennis and the birth of their daughter, Desiree. Not stopping at these relationships, many sources revealed that Bob Dylan also dated many other girls during his career. For example, in the early 1970s, Bob Dylan found himself entwined in a brief but notable romantic liaison with Sally Kirkland, an award-winning American actress and producer. The sparks between the two reportedly ignited during a party, leading to a whirlwind romance that captured the attention of the public and the media. Sally Kirkland, known for her illustrious career in Hollywood, had already made a name for herself as a former fashion model and a versatile actor with appearances in over 120 movies. Her career, which spanned more than six decades, showcased her talent and versatility, earning her accolades and recognition in the film industry. The romance between Kirkland and Dylan, though short-lived, became a subject of intrigue and fascination. The details of their relationship, which lasted no more than a few months, were scrutinized by the media and fans alike. Dylan, a cultural icon with a penchant for keeping his personal life private, momentarily stepped into the spotlight with Kirkland. Bob Dylan also took a prolonged and tumultuous turn with his relationship with Ruth Tyrangiel, which spanned over two decades starting in the mid-1970s. Their love story was marked by a series of on-and-off periods, characterized by moments of separation and reconciliation, contributing to the complexity of their enduring connection. Ruth Tyrangiel, unlike some of Dylan's more publicized partners, led a life away from the limelight. Despite being less known in the public sphere, she gained recognition due to her enduring and somewhat enigmatic relationship with the iconic singer-songwriter. In contrast to the glamorous world of fame and entertainment, Tiringil maintained a lower profile, allowing their relationship to unfold away from the prying eyes of the media. Tiringiel's background as a former lawyer added an intriguing layer to her persona. 
Her professional pursuits, while less spotlighted, hinted at a woman with her own ambitions and accomplishments outside the realm of Dylan's fame. The contrast between the private life she chose and the whirlwind world of Dylan's celebrity added a layer of complexity to their relationship. The on and off nature of their romance invited speculation and curiosity from fans and observers. While some details of their relationship remain shrouded in privacy, the public glimpses into their journey reveal a narrative of love that endured despite its challenges. Dylan, known for his cryptic lyrics and enigmatic persona, seemed to find certain stability and connection in his long-running relationship with Tyron Gill. As a former lawyer, Tyron Gill likely brought a different perspective to her relationship with Dylan. The dynamics of their connection were likely influenced by her professional background and the unique challenges that accompany being romantically involved with a cultural icon. The fact that their relationship endured for over two decades suggests a depth and resilience that transcended the typical ebb and flow of celebrity romances. What do you think about Bob Dylan's love life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.